Writing Out Loud, a program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My very, very special guest today is the legendary author N. Scott Momaday. Thank you for being here, Scott. Thank you for having me. We visited many times <laughs> about your famous novel, House Made of Dawn, which won the Pulitzer Prize. Today I thought we'd talk more about your poetry. Good. If that's okay with you. And one of your collections, In the Presence of the Sun and Other Stories, which is one of my all-time favorites, I've got to tell you, has recently been republished by the University of New Mexico Press. Now, the original publication was over 20 years ago, and the poems themselves span 30 years or so. When you look back at a work like this, how do you see you've evolved as a poet over the years? Well, I hope I've... Uh, I hope I've uh, improved steadily. I've, I've been working at poetry for many, many years. And um, I, I, you know, when I, when I first started, I thought, uh, this, is, this is poetry. But it wasn't. I didn't know what poetry was mm -hmm. until I, uh, I had really good instruction. I, I, was, I was a fellow, a Stegner fellow at Stanford, worked with Ivor Winters, who mm -hmm. was a wonderful critic and poet himself. So he taught me a good deal about uh, traditional English forms of, of poetry. And that was exactly the background I needed. Once I had possession of that, I could strike out on my own and find my own voice. So it's been developing over the years. You know, I've also noticed that some of your mm. more recent poems are shorter. Have you learned an economy of style? Is that something hard for an artist to master? I think it is. It's, it's like prose in that in that mm -hmm. way I think it's <coughs> it's more difficult in, in some ways to write a short piece of fiction say than a long piece of fiction you you have less elbow room and and uh, you have to you have to uh, you have to be concentrated you mm -hmm. have to train yourself to focus narrowly and I think it's the same with poetry in the preface to in the presence of the sun you mentioned a, a fellowship you accepted in Moscow and said that that really turned out to be a major turning point in your life now mm -hmm. you were only there six months why did this impact you so uh, because it was so exotic to me I I'd never I'd never been in a <coughs> in a place like like Russia uh, it, it's very different. They have different ways of thinking in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, the, in what is now Russia. Uh, it was the Soviet Union in my day. I was very mm -hmm. much behind the Iron Curtain when I went there. But what a fascinating experience. Mm -hmm. It wasn't comfortable, but it was fascinating, and I dearly loved it. And I've been back a number of times. Did it make you look at life in, in this country differently? Yes, yes. What about your art? Did it help you view your art in a different way? You know, uh, interestingly, I really started my art in Moscow. I'd, I'd grown up watching my father paint, mm -hmm. who, was a, who was a fine artist, and I had learned a lot by osmosis. But I, I didn't, wasn't interested in doing it myself until I got to Russia. And then something about the, the place and the distance away from my, my native heath gave me an inspiration to start drawing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that developed into painting and printmaking, so that's really a kind of genesis for me. Another thing I love about your book, In the Presence of the Sun and Other Stories, is that we see how closely your art and your, your poetry are integrated. Does one gift trump the other? Are you, do you see things and then you, you are able to write about them, or is it the reverse of that? I think you see things and, uh, you know, they make some kind of impression and they make they give you some sort of inspiration so you, your art comes out of that kind of experience. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, an interesting thing for me going from writing to painting and back again is um, I find writing a very, very concentrated kind of mm -hmm, experience. Mm -hmm. And when you're writing, you don't have time or even the inclination to do anything else. But when you're painting, at least this is true in my case, uh, uh, that's a relaxation. Mm -hmm. I can listen to music or a baseball game or something while I'm painting. I can't do that when I'm writing. 
Mm, very interestingly put. You mentioned your dad, and he illustrated your master work, The Way to Rainy Mountain. Mm -hmm. What was it like working with him on that project? Oh, it was great fun. Uh, he he um, he did those illustrations in pen and ink, which was not a, a the usual kind of medium for him, but he did it so well, and I think is a wonderful dimension to that book. Did you discuss the various illustrations that he did? Not much, you know. I we we talked about the text, we talked about the various stories and so on, and then he just took off on his own and and uh, illustrated those that he wanted to. And it turned out so well. I just wondered, though, you know, if sharing this vision with him helped you deepen your relationship in a way. Oh, I think so. Yeah, I think we both uh, be we came closer because of that experience working together. Yeah, but you know, I'm looking through, uh, showing some of his his illustrations here. And which of the illustrations is your favorite? Do you have a favorite of his Rainy Mountain illustrations? I think the Storm Spirit, <laughs> Mankai. It's this very strange. Uh, Part horse, part fish, lightning issuing from the from the mouth and uh, the tail whipping the tornadic wind. I like that uh, that figure very much. The storm spirit. You mentioned learning from os by, uh, from him by osmosis. What can you give us some specifics about that? What if one thing you could point to that you learned from him as an artist? What would it be? Uh, the kind of fun he had doing it, I think. Really? Yeah, he, he uh, frequently invited uh, another artist to come and work with him. And uh, I would be listening to what was going on in the studio. I'd be outside, but I would, could hear through the door. And they just had the most wonderful time together, <laughs> talking and laughing and joking while they were working. So I thought, gee, that can't be bad. That, uh, I think I'll try that at some point. So. That, uh, that gave me a lot of incentive to paint. Did he know of your interest in art? Oh, yeah, yeah, he knew of it. Uh, did he, and he encouraged you? And y well, yes, I, I think he realized uh, that while I was growing up, I was really more interested in writing than in painting, and that was fine with him. But uh, I think he also knew, even before I did, that I would eventually paint. So I think he was delighted. The Way to Rainy Mountains become a contemporary classic. Why do you think so many people have responded to that book like they have? I think it illustrates um, um, something that is uh, unusual in, in the normal American experience. Um, it's uh, purely native and it represents a highly developed oral tradition. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's full of um, an aesthetics, uh, philosophy, a uh, sense of humor, and uh, most of all, a connection to the land. And I think that just appeals to people. Oh, yes, and the ancestral voices are so powerful mm -hmm. in that. When you write a book of that magnitude that touches you so deeply, does it change who you are? Oh, I think so, yeah. I think when you write, you... Uh, yeah, every, every kind of writing is autobiographical, you know, and, mm. you, and when you write, you find out uh, something about yourself that you hadn't known before. So it's a continual uh, experience of, of uh, discovery. Mm. Actually, The Way to Rainy Mountain was based on an earlier story that you wrote that had a very unique publishing history. I wonder if you might tell mm. us about that because there's a new edition of it out from the University of New Mexico yes, Press, yes. too. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting story. I had uh, started collecting tales from the Kiowa, from their oral tradition. So I had a collection of these. And I took my first uh, teaching post at the university level at um, the University of California at Santa Barbara. And when I was there, I met a, an artist, mm -hmm. a man who worked in the, uh, in the art department, and we became friends. He was a, a print specialist. Mm -hmm. He'd li he liked to do etchings. And uh, one day we were talking uh, in the, you know, having coffee and talking, and he said, you know, a friend of mine in the art department, um, he's a typographer, we have conceived the idea of making a book. We have an old Washington hand press in the department, so why not produce a book from scratch? We could all learn how to do something like mm -hmm. that. And she said, what we, what we don't have is a text. I will illustrate it, my friend will do the typography, and uh, we need a text. And I said, well, you know, I just happen to have some stories. <laughs> so that's how the three of us got together to produce a book called The Journey of Time A. Uh -huh. 
and uh, that became uh, that became in time um, the way to Rainy Mountain. But we did produce a hundred copies of a uh, of the Journey of Time A, and uh, we in those days we could. Uh, afford through the university to to buy the best possible paper and uh, mm. we had the edition bound in leather and it was all wonderful experience book learning experience so that's how that came about and now the university of new mexico press has brought out that that first edition and the original 100 or, or, or talk about rare volumes they're pretty rare yeah they're hard to find and they're expensive oh i can imagine so but what a wonderful experience for you as an author to have have the very best of everything yeah. in one volume <laughs> i mean that had, had those, to be, those were the days those <laughs> those were absolutely the days and yeah. now we read on kindles yeah, exactly. <laughs> you and i both do read yeah. read read electronically now you said once scott that ancestral voices define your being do you still feel that way Yes, yes, certainly. On a daily basis, even, mm -hmm. even when you're not writing? I think so. I think it's so deeply established in, in, in the mind and, and heart that ancestral voices are indispensable. Do you think we're losing touch with our ancestral voices? Mm -hmm. I think most, uh, most people in, in our society you know, have lost touch with uh, ancestral voices. We, uh, we have become very modern creatures and uh, we have learned how to, how to depend so much upon technology. Mm -hmm. we've, we've lost touch with uh, deeper things really, like, the, like living harmoniously with the earth and appreciating the spirit of, uh, of nature. Um, we need to reestablish that. You know, you and I were talking before we started typing that we both love gadgets. We yeah. all we like iPods <laughs> and we like iPhones <laughs> and, and Kindles and all of the, the these these fun fun gadgets. You were one of the first people I know to get a BlackBerry. How do you keep in touch with both worlds? I mean, you're very progressive and you're on top of all the technology, mm -hmm. and yet you're you're you have this inter interconnection with with your heritage. I think it's embedded. I think it's up here in the mind and in the in the soul. Um, uh, I just grew up, you know, uh, inheriting that kind of appreciation of the natural world. And you don't lose that mm -hmm. once you have it. Mm -hmm. That's, it determines the way you think throughout your life, I think. So the gadgets are extracurricular. <laughs> there's something. We're all strapped to wristwatches, but, um, you know, I think some of us uh, uh, hunger for a, a deeper and more realistic um, way of life. So the Indian has an advantage in that sense. Ab absolutely. Yeah. And do you think the poet has an advantage if you're poet? Mm -hmm. Because you've actually said before that you think of poetry as a naming ceremony. And I might wonder if you might explain to those who aren't familiar with naming ceremonies what those are. Well, yeah, in, in, in the native world, uh, there is nothing more important than names and uh, conferring a name and receiving a name. This, this is really something... Um, important and and words if you stop to think about language itself it's a system of, of naming mm -hmm. um, words are, are the names of things and uh, you begin to understand how important it is to bear a name uh, to confer a name to live up to your name yes yeah I think we're getting careless with names these days yeah I uh, think so too uh, we're getting careless with a lot of things mm. these days we need to get back uh, in the groove Another native symbol that recurs periodically in your poetry, and one of my favorites is the bear. Also, bear also turns up in your artwork. Why the bear? Why is figuratively, literally, literally what does bear mean to you? Bear is a sacred animal. Um, it's, uh, I think one of the reasons it is so, it, it is so sacred in nature is that it, uh, the bear resembles the human so much. There's very, you know, bears are curious creatures in, in the sense that they can stand on their hind legs, they can dance, they can twist their forearms uh, like humans. They have a human-like voice. Uh, and uh, the, the, there are so many accounts by historians, explorers, and so on, accounts of uh, bears having the appearance, skinned bears having mm -hmm. the appearance of human beings. So there's something very human about bears. Mm -hmm. 
and there's something very bear-like in certain humans. So. <laughs> <laughs> it, isn't that the truth? You've even written what you call the Bear God Dialogues, and mm. I'm hoping, I, should Bear get top billing in that? I'm not quite sure that I remember. Uh, it's sort of an equal status. E e equal <laughs> status. What do Bear and God have to say to each other? Oh, you know, in, in, my, uh, in my view, when I was writing the dialogues, they have a lot to talk about. Uh, and they talk on different subjects, such as time, prayer, um, archaeology, uh, what have you, death. And, and they're witty. They're witty people. They're witty characters. They talk and have fun talking. And the conversations are, they're very lively. Mm. It was fun to write those, and I think it's fun to read them. Mm. In fact, your, your mother's name, Natachi, means bear, is that correct? I think so, yes, in some, some connection, yes. So, so, so bear is in your lineage? Oh, yes, yes. You're I, very I, much a bear. I am, and, and uh, again, we get back to the naming aspect. Is when I was an infant, I was taken to Devil's, what is called Devil's Tower, Wyoming, in Kiowa. It's called Tsowai Tali, Rock Tree. And there's a story in oral tradition about uh, a boy who turned into a bear on that, play, on that spot. So by being taken to this place, um, I, I, when, I, when we returned to Oklahoma with where my grandparents were living, uh, an old man came uh, and gave me the name. So I Tali, rock mm -hmm. tree boy, mm -hmm. and I identify with the boy who turned into a bear. Mm -hmm. That was really a wonderful gift he gave you. Oh yes, yes. When giving you that, you've got a new book coming out, a new collection called "Again the Far Morning." What a lovely, lovely title! It includes selected poems plus some wonderful new poetry mm. that you've been doing, and I think that all these poems, Scott, emphasize not only the native tr tradition, which of course you're very much attuned to, but also you're a renaissance man. I mean, you work so well in all media and, and, and all cultures, and I wanted to get you to read one of your poems, The Galleries, which I think illustrates that so well. It, it crosses ethnic boundaries, it crosses mm -hmm. cultural boundaries. Oh yes, okay, The Galleries. And this again is from the, uh, a collection called Again the Far Morning, mm -hmm. the galleries. Do you sense them there, the ones who invented art, who saw that we might see? They linger now within these galleries, mute, marginal in their minds, and surpassing in their touch. What masterpieces they wrought, images that leapt through time, engulfed in the perfect night of millennia and cold, skeletal stillness pending, closer than the walls around. How did they reckon future, indeed immortality, the primal forms they imaged yet proceed from some beyond, they remain undivided from the dead and present hand. Mm, that's just a, a beautiful, beautiful poem. Do you remember what mental images you saw in your mind's eye as you were writing that poem? I was, re I was remembering visiting uh, caves like Glasgow mm -hmm. and, and Altamira. Um, so yes, I had these images of the paintings on the rocks in mind, ancient, you know, thousands of years old. At Altamira, the, they estimate that these paintings were made 17,000 years ago and existed in the darkness from that time until, you know, the current century. So, to me, that's wonderful. Oh, it, it is wonderful. And, you know, what's amazing in this book, we see your inspiration from, from, from the cave paintings and also from poets like Emily Dickinson, who are very far removed from, who's mm -hmm. very far removed from your background. I mean, she lived most of her life in her bedroom. You're very well-traveled. Uh, she was a New Englander. You're, you're an Oklahoman. Mm -hmm. And you've written what you call rhymes for Emily, and I thought you might read this one for <laughs> yeah. us, too. This is a kind of epigram. Rhymes for Emily. She wrote with such ungodly haste, you'd think there'd be a lot of waste. Fact is, she listened to the birds and learned the twittering of words. I love that. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. What is it about Emily Dickinson's work that inspires you so much as a poet? I think Emily Dickinson is maybe the greatest of American poets. Uh, I was introduced to her Oh, a long time ago, and, and uh, in graduate school, I, I sort of emphasized my, my interest in, in her work. And then on a Guggenheim uh, fellowship, I went to Amherst, oh. and I, I uh, read her in manuscript. You mm -hmm. know, her manuscripts mm -hmm. are almost equally divided between 
Harvard and Amherst. Mm -hmm. And I was going back and forth between the two places that year reading her, her manuscripts. So I'm one of the people who has read her in, uh, in her own hand. And I fell in love with her work. I think she, she was, uh, her gift, her endowment was so great, it's, it's hard to imagine. I can't think of a, a more gifted poet in American literature. You even visited her upstairs bedroom, didn't you? I did, yeah. I've been in her, her house, her, the mansion there on Main Street. And you told me once, uh, you were talking about her poem, A slant, Certain Slant of Light. Mm. Uh, she didn't title her poems, but it is one. And you said that when you, you were in that bedroom that you could actually understand that poem better? You know, you can. Uh, you can be in Amherst and environs and really get an insight into the thing she wrote about. When she talks about a certain slant of light, um, you know, in the winter, um, there is that slant of light, and it is, it is uh, I don't know of any place else that has the same quality of light. So I got to see that and to see exactly what she was seeing herself. And that's a very interesting and uh, exciting thing. If you could go back in time and ask Emily Dickinson one question, what would it be? Oh, boy. That's tough. Uh, how did you... How did you um, how did you manifest your, your, your power of observation so well and so distinctly? Um, you know, she, she's a master of concision. Mm -hmm. She can condense uh, a, a profound idea into two lines. That really takes something. And that's what you're doing now in your work. Well, I'm trying to do that, and it's not easy, but uh, it's worthwhile, worth trying. I'm going to prevail upon you to read one more poem, one more new poem for us, for Wilma Mankiller, an honor song, a tribute to your dear friend. <laughs> yes, yes, I remember Wilma with great love and longing. For Wilma Mankiller, an honor song. Your spirit is known to the earth. You are worthy of great renown. The river knows of your spirit. The forest knows of your spirit. The mountain knows of your spirit. The prairie knows of your spirit. Your spirit is known to the earth. Your spirit is known to the animals. You are worthy of great renown. The eagle knows of your spirit. The bear knows of your spirit. The wolf knows of your spirit. The mountain lion knows of your spirit. Your spirit is known to the animals. Your spirit is known to those who now welcome you. Let them keep you safe in their camp forever. We who follow, let us sing and dance in your honor. What a lovely, lovely remembrance yeah, of Wilma. It was a privilege to write that in her memory. When someone has played such an important role in your life like Wilma has, such an important role in our state's history and our country's history, how hard is the concision then when you have to condense, the, get, condense all of that down into a, a, to an honor song? Well, the song itself, the form of the song, the honor song in, in the native tradition is, is concise. So that's the way to go about it, I think. If you tried it in any other form, it would probably take longer. You'd, you'd end up mm -hmm. with, uh, with something more extraneous than the honor song itself, which is very, um, which is very intrinsic and essential. Mm -hmm. So just choosing the form gives you a, a kind of um, uh, precision in your statement that is important. The book, the, the new book, again, The Far Morning, is dedicated to your late wife, Barbara. Mm -hmm. And she has a new collection of poetry coming out right before yours called the Poems Before Easter. Mm -hmm. When you read those poems, as a poet, do you find things in them that surprise you about Barbara, even as close as you were? Yes, yes. Could you give us some examples? Well, she, she wrote um, uh, over a period of many years, uh, and, and this book, which is posthumously published, is the first book of hers. And luckily, um, I, should, I should use the word blessing, I suppose, she knew that it was going to be published before she died, and uh, that meant so much to her and to me. Mm -hmm. So to have it coming out, uh, and, and to have it as, as, as rich as it is, she wrote, as I say, over years, and she, her, the range of her writing is very great. She, she wrote uh, things uh, about classical uh, mythology, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. and she wrote things that uh, are very immediate and, um, 
it's you know to read her her work now is is like discovering uh, all over again who she was and that's very exciting to me one critic has re described them uh, the p collection as poems of intense yearning would you agree with that uh -huh, there is that element in them certainly I think it's perfect that the, that the two books are coming out so closely together. In what way do you see Barbara's book and your book complementing each other and maybe telling a larger story, writing a larger poem? Well, I think in both books, uh, you know, is she was thinking of me part of the time when she was writing, and they're clear tr poems that are clearly dedicated to me, even, even though not specified. Mm -hmm. And, and in my work, the same thing. I yes. wrote poems uh, that, uh, in which I had her in mind very much. So they, there's, it's a kind of love story uh, that you, you can find uh, uh, mingled in with uh, the words, and that's important to me. You've had such a distinguished career, Scott. You've recently received the mm -hmm. National Medal in the Arts. We're showing a picture of you getting this award from President Bush. Tell us about your future plans. What are you working on now? I'm working on poetry. I, I've been uh, since uh, since Barbara's passing, uh, and since my retirement, I've had um, a good deal of time, and I'm I'm presently in a wheelchair, um, which confines me and uh, has is, has has made me um, uh, less mobile than than I usually am. And I find that all of this contributes to my productivity. I have very little <laughs> else to do than write, so I get up early and uh, go to the computer and I start writing, you know, and, and I write until I'm, I'm tired of it. it. That's usually four or five hours, so I have a lot of time to write. And I've been very productive over the last couple of years. This new book of poems is uh, finished and about to come out, and I have very nearly completed another one, which oh. I haven't submitted as yet. I can't wait until our next visit, Scott. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you too, Teresa. It's been wonderful. And thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud.